Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're actually in uh, Chambers B. Uh, it's a little bit different. Uh, I believe we're running live. This is the Wednesday, September 14th meeting of the Town Council's Finance Committee meeting. Uh, I call to order for the minutes just to note all the members of the Town Council's committee is here. We also have the uh, Finance Director, Ruth Porter, and we also have our Town Manager and a few uh, folks from other departments in our audience. Uh, with that, um, if we could have a uh, motion to approve the minutes of August 3rd, 2016. So moved. Second. Any amendments or <coughs> other requirements? No. All in favor? It's three to zero. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the revised financial statements as of June 30th, 2016. Uh, just for the record, uh, last meeting we got a preliminary review of those. These are internal and unaudited. Um, and I'll turn this over to Tom and Ruth. Yeah, I'm going to put that right to Ruth. She's the one who prepared these. I don't know if I can get it to you. Though. No, that's fine. We have, um, I've, I've given two reports. The first one is labeled A, and that's the same standard reports we normally give on a quarterly basis. It compares the, essentially the current quarter, um, which in our case is June 30th still, because we're not at the end of the next quarter, with last year's numbers. And um, they include the balance sheet, the revenues, and the expenditures. And then... The second one, which is labeled B, which I think is the one probably we want to focus more on because you've already seen portions of A. Mm -hmm. um, B is the one that shows where we were for June 30th back in July when we had our last Finance Committee meeting and as of September, well, this month essentially, for June 30th. So there have been a few changes. Um, the biggest increase is that we've... Uh, up until that point, we had, had not yet posted the May debt revenues, and we also advanced refunded some debt. So um, that's why there's a, a large revenue increase, but also a, a, a large expenditure increase because we received the advanced refunding for the bonds, and then we had to turn around and pay them out. And... Um, I think most of the other ones are related to receivables and payables. Uh, we have posted the accrued wages. I don't remember if we've done the accrued sick or not, and accrued vacation we might have, or if not, they'll be shortly. We have. Okay. Yes, we did. <laughs> so are these final, relatively final? Is that what you're saying? No. We still have all of the... Uh, other funds, yeah. what we do is we work on the other funds. For example, I have scholarships done in the uh, agency, uh, excuse me, the permanent funds, which are the trust funds done, uh, cemetery trust funds. Those are done. The next step we'll be, I'll be working on are the capital projects, and as we uh, review the current projects for the school and the current projects for the town, we decide if any of them can be closed. If they do, they close to the general fund. So to that degree, there will be some changes there. Once capital projects are done, we start special revenues. We do those same things. Uh, we have some accounts, for example, the beach monies. We, we make sure the general fund beach accounts are made whole. So that means if we budgeted, pick a number, $10,000, we're showing we spent 10000 If we actually spent less than that, those extra funds go into the special revenue. If we spend more than that, we take it out so that the general fund is always made whole. And that's the same thing with the revenues. If we collect more beach revenues, those excess revenues go into the special revenue fund. And that builds that fund up for when we need uh, to do some renovations, such as uh, fix the beach house, you know, the restrooms, or redo the parking lot. So those so monies would typically come back through the CFP program? And they would be used as reserve funds to fund the capital project. So those are the two really the big ones that we'll have to get done. And then we also have to do some uh, which are more in the entity-wide ones. Uh, we have to do some accruals. We have to uh, take a look and say, okay, at, we paid our debt in May, most of our you know interest payment in May, but we had to accrue the unpaid interest from May to June, so we have to accrue that in the entity-wide statements. Fixed assets show up in the entity-wide 
statements. We're still working on those. So, so just so, I, so if I look back at Exhibit A, when I look at this back, the fund balance increased to point six million. And then on Exhibit B, you've done some adjustments which changed that by thirty-five thousand. These other adjustments you're talking all I'm trying to do is zero in on what do we think the fund balance change is going to be. Is this in the ballpark? Are those other adjustments you're talking about large? They could so be large. Um, I'm not sure where we are with the Wentworth uh, interest payment. I'm not sure. I don't remember at this stage yeah. if I've actually made that transfer or not. I know we haven't spent it in the general fund, whether or not we've actually allocated that over to the Wentworth project or vice versa, I think it's going to come back to the general fund. You know, those pieces are not done yet, so that will affect. So when do you think we'll have a, a firmer understanding of where we ended up last June? Um, our, our financial statements, they're not final until you get the actual document from, the, from us through the audit. So right. up until that that week, they could be changing. Because once we've made our changes and the auditors come in and actually audit the records, they make changes. But when so, do you think your changes will be final? Um, probably sometime in November. <clears throat> Any questions? So, uh, Ruth, if I can understand this, um, so this is great as far as seeing where we are as of today, or the 7th. So the question I have is that uh, in the general fund, just looking at it from an expenditure account, um, in July, we were $3.3 million under expense. No, overexpense. Because the negative number, negative number in expense is actually positive, correct? Okay, you're in. You're in the. I'm looking at uh, exhibit A. Exhibit A. Well, and I'm comparing it to uh, exhibit, exhibit B. B, the second to the last page. So I'm just looking and it, well, kind of, yeah. Correct, and part of that has to do with how much we yeah. when we put our budgets together. We estimate what we think we're going to be bonding, mm -hmm. and it may or may not correlate to what we actually bond. So I think in some respects we're overspent because we did that, that, that fairly large advanced refunding that we didn't budget to do. So, uh, so actually, uh, just to, yeah. so I'm comparing the right documents. This is called year-to-date revenues. Um, it doesn't have a page number, but... This is where it has the 1100 general fund account mm -hmm. with the grand totals and it got, so I'm looking at A versus B. And so um, originally in A, there was a $4.5 million excess revenue position that's shown as a negative. However, the variance is now a $5.1 million positive number. So is that a full $10 million swing or is it just a, a difference in presentation? I think it's just a difference in presentation. See what I'm we looking at on the glasses, so I have to take them off and on, so I apologize. So I'm, and this is A, and this is, uh, no, so it's this page here. Mm -hmm. And it shows $4.5 million as a negative number, which I believe is a positive, because that means you have more revenues, that you have more re actual revenues than That's expenses. expenditures. Or more revenues than budgeted. This one here, right, I just want to make sure, I think I did it right. I think it is just presentation, and now that I've been able to look at it, because that's a positive 5.1. So I just wanted to. Right, I think that it is. means I think we're it is. over collected. Yeah, so we, we have $5.1 million in excess revenues based upon at least unaudited. Correct. Okay. And then when you take into consideration expenses, which is the next page, we have. We're overexpended as well. Right, cause it, which is, can happen, it's expected. So that compares to what value in A? I'm looking for the right report in A. It would be the, the bottom I'm not fourth to... page, I believe. If, 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 
Um, what you're comparing. Just the revenues. But just well, I think, I think the, you started to talk about, which I didn't understand. It looks like if you look at that same thing, yep. Sean, line item nine, number 99, other financial sources, mm -hmm. there's a $4.4 million swing. Right. But if you go down to debt, it's a four point million dollar swing. So those are the two items that really that are, change these numbers. Yes. Correct. And, and what were those exactly again? What were those caused by? We had uh, we have debt that we owe from we, we borrowed money in 2006, 2007, 2008, and 2009. We essentially borrow every year. Portions of those years bond payments, debt payments, we've essentially advance refunded, and then. That means the, the debt wasn't due until <coughs> 2000, what year we in, like 2017, 18, 19, and 20. Some of that debt wasn't due, principal and interest payments. Yeah. So we took that money and we said, no, we're going to pay it today. And then we're going to borrow more. Refinance it at a lower rate. Refinance. So out of the $3.8 that we paid back, we only had to borrow $3 million seven, And then we received some premium money. So, so if we had paid that debt when it was due, we'd be paying the full 3.8 million. But now we're only going to have to pay 3.7 million. So on this exhibit, you're saying that that exercise saved $350,000? Is that what you're saying? Plus the difference. There's some premium involved in this too. So um, it's I don't think it's quite that much. I think it was like 15 or 20,000. But because of the premium, and this applies to the rest of the bond issue. We didn't have to borrow. But we were going to originally borrow three million eight hundred and thirty thousand of new money, not refunded money. That was to fund CIP projects of one sort or another. But yeah, we only but had to borrow like three million eight hundred thousand. So we saved thirty thousand there, fifteen thousand from the other one, and we had bond premium to help us with. But, that. but I'm still <coughs> trying to understand if if, if the additional revenue was four point four million which is line 99, and the additional expense was $4 million, then that's a $380,000 swing. And that's probably the bond premium. Yep. There, there are other things in those line items aside from the bonds, though, correct? Oh, correct. We also okay. receive a, a, if, for example, with the school department, they may not have received some of their monies from the state until after June 30th. Those become receivables in the current year, in 2016. So we record the revenue in 2016, and then we book the receivable. So there could be some of that. I know it's we, the state owed us for the veterans exemption. They owed us for a tree growth, and they've paid us for one of those in July and August. But their revenues for, for fiscal 2016. So those revenues get added on. So it's recorded, the transaction is recorded as a receivable and as a revenue. And then when you in get, 16. when you actually get the payment in July and August. It, you reduce it, the receivable. You increase cash and you reduce the receivable Correct. as an offset. I think just, I think for clarification, because it's kind of hard to, for the public in particular. So an advanced refund is that it needs to be um, kind of viewed as um, bond issuers are giving you a deposit of money in which you're agreeing to then pay over time X dollars plus an interest. It's just it's because it's a bond versus a loan. It's, it's kind of both. It's interchangeable to some extent. So when you refund that, you're in essence paying it off with other sources and you're refinancing it. But I want to make sure, because um, some people don't understand, we're not refinancing it for a longer period of time. It is for the same length of time that was originally bonded. It's just that the market might be more favorable today for Interest it could be rates. a half a basis point, you know, being 50 basis point, or it could be 1% or whatever. So the cost is, is more favorable. <coughs> that's why we get the premium. Right. Correct. Every, every time we go to market, that's one of the exercises the financial advisor will do. He'll look at our existing debt and see if there's any opportunities for right. uh, refining or refunding that, that debt so the, at a cheaper And premium. then what we do is we actually pay that refunded debt yes. to a third party. They hold it, and their goal because we're only giving them some of the money, yep. you know, not the full amount that technically would be owed, is they're going to make that up because they're investing that and they're hoping that they're going to make that difference up. Right. And so the bulk of that additional revenue and expenditure is related to this advanced refunding. It sounds like there's some other ancillary things that, were, that affect it, but the vast majority of that 
But from so a fund account. Is, is debt related. Yep. So from a fund account, when the cash actually comes in, though, it's not dispersed all in one lump sum as a reduction. It's actually dispersed based upon the original schedule? No. Is it all at uh, once? It's all dispersed at once. It is, okay. I thought and then it was we have a new schedule. And we can't, I think by law, we can't go any further than <clears throat> the original debt. Oh, okay. That's where I, I missed. Okay. Yeah. Which is why we received 4.3 and paid out right. 4. But depending on the terms of the bonds, sometimes, as Ruth said, is rather than paying off, if they're not callable, we can't pay them off directly. There's a third party escrow agent that we pay. Yeah. And then they're responsible for paying those future debt payments on our behalf. It doesn't close out. We still owe money on the 2006, 7, 8, and 9, I believe. There's some of, I think one did get paid off in full, but the other ones, we might have one or two more payments left in the upcoming couple of years, but then they kind of go away. And can you, can you talk a little bit about on then line fund 7100, which is the general school fund. There's a $500,000 increase in expenditure. What was that for? This is exhibit B down under. There's a, there's a $500 swing in additional expenditure for school general fund. What do what do we know now that we didn't know on July? Um, that I'm not sure about. It could be their accrued wages. They have uh, significantly higher pay than 70% of their budget is, is wage related, so they would have to I think if I understand 100%, then the school's contracts run through like June 30th. So as of June 30th, even though sometimes their contract goes to September, August 31st, their, our fiscal year ends June 30th. So the payments that the payrolls that are being paid in July and August are really for this fiscal year. So they're booking those back. To June. Do you know if retirement uh, increased as well? Because I, I know as of a year or two ago, it wasn't a hundred percent of the retirement teacher retirement. It was a portion of it. It was a portion. I think it's still. I don't know that for sure. Okay. okay. So um, it's just like our payroll. As it shows, it's we have seven days. Um, and then nine of, of one year, we had seven days for our accrued pay that we turned and charged back. So one full week plus two additional days of the following week uh, that we charged to July, we actually should have, we really belonged to June because that's when the work was earned, our, the services were provided. And this year we have for the town, there's nine days. So we're, we have more accrued pay in fiscal 16 than we did in fiscal just a quick question. So are we on a cash basis accounting or are we on accrual basis accounting? We're on what's called a modified accrual. That means we, uh, at year end, we bring everything up to full accrual. During the year, we, the modified piece is that uh, we accrue our revenues. So for example, we bill our property taxes. We book the full revenue at the beginning, well, once the taxes are committed. And then we create a receivable. So, and we do, we're doing that with our rescue uh, billing also. But on the expenditure side, it's pretty much kind of a cash basis. We're paying it as we go. In some respects, we do know some of those ahead of time. So, you know, it's, but not very many of them. The only reason I ask that question is because these, these are pretty, I mean, the snapshot was as of 7, 2016. Now we're talking as of on Exhibit B, as of 9, 20. These are pretty big adjustments. And just it, how much more work would it be for us to be on a full accrual year-round? Uh, more staff, definitely. Yeah. What's the advantage? I, I'm not sure that there is an advantage. I mean, we could sit down and do these statements but we don't have enough staff right now to, to, to so, do that. So is the advantage in the way we do business today, is that from a staffing model perspective versus, um, is it also, um, I know that we do a lot around certification of our financials that you've been working on for like 10 years. Um, the modified approach, is that part of that standard? Um, would we lose certification if we went to a full accrual? No. 
we probably would if we went to full cash though. So yeah, I'm not sure we want to do that. No, but no, no. not this size. Yeah, I think modified accrual is kind of the standard it's error. The standard for probably most. Probably is calculated long term. So the net net is that we are still looking at is it a two and a half million dollar surplus? And I did I have the numbers right? I had to go to a couple of pages. Well, if um, if I look at a the second and third page, the total revenues as of September for June thirtieth were about eighty two million eight hundred thousand. Expenditures were eighty million one seventy five. So that we're looking at about a one one point five ish. Correct. Okay. And the bulk of that, I will say, has to do with the uh, we received sure, we'll almost seven hundred thousand more in excise revenues than projected, and we also have uh, the unspent Wentworth proceeds because of the uh, premium. So uh, I guess this gets to the crux of at least why I think um, evaluating this information on the interim basis is important. So this past year we allocated, I believe, wasn't it a million dollars from the designated, undesignated fund relating to the whole school piece? We didn't do the full. Wasn't it one million dollars? No, they were only. Uh, oh, in the current budget? For the current budget? Which in the is this budget? current budget. 2016? Isn't it in this budget? This, the, the, the year they just ended at June 30th, right. so we allocated a portion of the Wentworth monies, the bond issue with the Wentworth, because we just allocated the new portion for this year's budget, which then used it all up. Isn't that what happened? No. Pull yourself forward one more year. Okay, we so this past this. year was the only year that we used. We used it the first portion, and so next year, okay. So this 1.5 is truly related to operational issues and not a financing bond there's nothing related to the, the bond. Correct. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. No. All right. Sean, yep. how, how, yeah. how did you get to 1.5? I'm looking at. Sure. Um, so um, when I looked at the original, so I'm looking at just the revenues. The original projections of revenues was 79.3 million. You subtract that from the new projection of 82.8. That's up to a two and a half million dollar surplus on the right. revenue side. And on the expense side, um, it was also 79.3. The new amount is 80.1. That difference is 875. So, um, 800. So it's like 1.7 million dollars in surplus. So, 2.5 million in surplus revenues, 875 thousand dollar increase in expenses. The net would be the 1.6. Then, then how could can you? How can you? If I look at Exhibit A. It says the fund balance. So I'm looking at B because A well, yeah, is gone by. Well, yeah, but if you look at A, the starting point was 2.6 million. Much. Fund balance, 2.6 million dollar increase. And then on Exhibit B, with all the changes they're talking about, it was another 35. <coughs> so that would suggest that the fund balance was 2.6, not year one. So I, I, I'm trying to get from Exhibit A, Exhibit B. Year 1.5. So um, you're comparing the balance sheet, which I, I just to make sure we're looking. At, I'm looking purely at the P and L or profit and expenditures loss. and profit and loss P and L. So the, but, P &L, but the balance sheet has to flow from the P and L. Right. So you have to look at the P and L, not from what was previously stated, but what is stated on the new. But then, I, and I guess I just then I don't understand how these exhibits work. If it was 2.6 million on the balance sheet in Exhibit A. And the new exhibit B says all the net changes that occurred on the balance sheet, which is the P and L, drove thirty-five thousand. <clears throat> so isn't isn't uh, exhibit A as of June thirtieth numbers, and then exhibit B is actual September numbers? Well, I think it's I think exhibit B says what changed from exhibit A, doesn't it? Is that what we're looking at? Exhibit A. Well, that's so, what, yeah, that's actually no. It changed from what was reported in July. Which is that middle so column. this was frozen in June, and Exhibit B is moving forward, right? Or am I or am I off? I, I don't know. I mean, I look at is it if, if I look at Exhibit A, which was given to us on nine seven. But oh, the okay. numbers report for at the top is the numbers were unaudited mm -hmm. June thirtieth numbers. So at, right. at, this is the snapshot from June thirty. Right, but I thought Exhibit B mm -hmm. walked that Exhibit A forward. 
and they're saying the difference between the unaudited numbers as of 9, 2016 and the unaudited numbers as of 7, 2016, these are the net changes, and that comes up to $35,000 is the net change in the fund balance. Part of the, um, on the balance sheet, we don't compare budget versus actual because the budgeted revenues should equal the budgeted expenditures, so uh, the appropriations. So we discount that on the balance sheet. We're just looking at pure actual revenues and expenditures. So, Peter, if because we have a balanced budget, so what we appropriate for expenditures should equal our estimated revenues. So, you know, if it's a million dollar appropriation and a million dollar revenues, I mean, I could show it here, but it's, you know, mm -hmm. plus a million, minus a million, it's zero. I can just, so, Peter, if you go to Exhibit A and page 4, and we're going to compare that to Exhibit B, page 2. So, on page 4, the revised budget, which is column 2, says that the revised budget for this cycle was $79.3 million in total expenditures. Yeah. Sorry, we're looking at the wrong one. I want the revenue page. That's the one before. No, yeah, sorry, um, because revenues have to equal budget, so it doesn't matter. <clears throat> so $79.3 million in expenditures was, 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 was approved. And you actually want to, and I apologize, it's actually page three on this one here, page three. However, what was actually spent based on unaudited was 80.2. So 79.3 minus 80.2 is a million dollars, just about a million dollars. Yeah, but I guess then, then I, what I don't understand is that, at least in my accounting experience, your profit and loss statement is what drives your balance sheet. I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't, your balance sheet can't have a different net balance fund then your profit lost it. But when they update the balance sheet, the update, the, she needs to update the balance sheet, and that's what gets audited. And then when we look at these, it's going to line up. Once we have final Once numbers. Once we have final numbers and all audited, the balance sheet will line up with this P&L statement. Uh, but I guess so, my question is mechanically, why doesn't the balance sheet line up? Because the balance sheet is historical. It's retrospective. It doesn't take into account everything that's happened on the P&L so far. So if we took a P&L, and correct me if I'm not doing this correctly, if we took a P&L from June 30th, it would line up with this balance sheet. But because we're, we're kind of forward-looking before the balance sheet is calculated, these are just kind of estimates to kind of give us an idea of what's moving around a little bit, that they won't line up with A. They'll line up with A after it's audited. Am, am I, is that wrong? That's pretty close. Um, the other piece, if you were to look at your revised appropriation, it's 79307 If you go, I'm looking at A, mm -hmm. the page 2 and page 3, mm -hmm. the revised appropriation, which is the expenditures, the budget is 79307 If you go to page 3, the revised estimated revenue is only $78.9 million. The expenditures are higher because we have purchase orders from the prior year that get added in. So um, it seems a little higher than normal. So we have 2015 purchase orders that uh, the items were ordered in 15, so they're encumbered. They weren't paid until 16. So that's part of why our appropriations look higher in 16 than they do in 15. I mean, then, then the revenues, excuse me. So that's the other reason. <coughs> Try to just look at the actuals. And we're at about $2 million higher, roughly, in our revenues. A million of it is the Wentworth, 700000 is excised, and that leaves us with about 300000 in miscellaneous other types of revenues and underexpended funds. I think we erred in that we're trying to be helpful. The first time that we reported year-end numbers, I know the numbers was back in July, and we provided all the caveats that this is going to change as, our, as we start to make some adjustments. And B, this display was intended to show you what internal adjustments she's made since the last time you saw this report, and the variance that's being reported shows, we just wanted to sh show you how these things are progressing. 
time. It sounds like there's still some more work to be done. Yeah, you know, three month. more months worth of work to be done, to be honest with you. So I think B probably just confused the conversation, uh, but that was the intent, is to show you how, the book, how, how things are getting tighter and changing as we're getting more exact and, and nearing the finish line. So, um, so back to the, so um, what I'm looking at, the reason for looking at, um, I understand the balance sheet to the extent that it's not perfect because it is point in time and hasn't taken into consideration all of the changes. So that's why I'm focusing strictly on the operating side. So right now though, we have about a one and a half, $1.6 million surplus until further changes are made, which ties into the discussion later around how we manage to that because that's the piece that's important. We know our we know our excise is up by almost seven hundred thousand. Yep. We know our uh, we have unspent Wentworth interest of a million. So, if baseline is, I would say we're going to be at least a million seven in additional fund balance. And I I'm thinking as we go along, it will probably go up. What do you, so Sean just said we had a million six. You're saying we have more. On adjustments, you're we're confident in that million six because I think we know there's, there's two sources. I think the excise and the yeah, I yeah. might it might be six. So it, that's the floor, and it's likely to, to grow a bit more than that. I don't think it's going to grow by leaps and bounds. It's uh, it's small adjustments here and there, but it's going to be more. And the school used uh, 425 in this in in fiscal 2016. They used 425 thousand of their fund balance that they used to balance the school's budget, but they didn't need to use it. So that even though we showed it as an estimate, it wasn't there aren't going to be any revenues to go with it. So, but it's also not going to reduce our fund balance. So, so and I, um, I haven't dealt with this in a while. So when auditors come in, there is a, and I don't remember the specific name of it, there's a threshold um, before it becomes, a, it's a materiality threshold. So um, when we're thinking about the difference in our conversations between 1.6 and 1.7 million, I believe for auditing purposes, it is considered materiality if it's greater than 5%. Actually, you know, I thought that they had a standard that they used they across. They don't tell you. But they, they have, you know, for capital projects, it might be 10%. For general fund, it oh, might be 2%. I mean, it, it just varies depending on the fund and the, and the how much. It makes them with the opinion of the auditor as to what is right. material weakness. So maybe this year, um, because it's, um, I mean, every, dollar is important and of course our threshold may be different than others that set up. Right. So if we can maybe find out what when that changes, what is when should we be concerned with the materiality of it? Is it two percent, one percent, five percent, you know, from um, you know and, and I'm saying from the overall, which is gonna be some type of average of everything. Um, so I guess I'm not what you're not sure what you're asking because we have a so million dollar revenue. Yeah, so let me so um, if we um, if the if the surplus is, is right now projecting based on numbers is 1.6 million. Whether it goes to 1.5 or 1.7 doesn't doesn't um, seem material to me. It might be to others, but not to me. But if it changes from 1.6 million to 1 million, or it increases from 1.6 to 2 million dollars, that is pretty significant. And so, when when should we be focused in on the materiality of that change? The, uh, probably as we find out, we yeah. would let you know. Uh, but in terms of the auditors. They won't consider that to be material. Uh, Sean, are you more thinking about future trending? So yes. Okay. As opposed right. to the change that might occur from where we are today yeah. when these book these books are closed, yeah. you're thinking year to year. Right. If our, sur our fund balance or surplus is yo-yo up and down, right. maybe those are some trends that we can talk about. But the auditors won't say you did oh, good or you did bad. But they'll, you know, the. Yeah. The bond agents, rating agencies. I mean, if, if they find something material, they are required to include that in the management note. Right, but um, their so materiality might be more that you didn't include this as a payable right. when you should have, or you didn't record this receivable when you should have, yeah. or um, those are the big ones that come to mind because it's or we didn't follow the policies that you've got written out and we've approved. Yeah. And, and, and the reason why I, I'm kind of focusing in on that is, and Tom hit on it, it's, it is about the trending. Because right now it's very difficult for the council and the finance committee to begin articulating a financial position for the town <clears throat> and its budget process if we're not getting the actual audit until January. 
So we have to use these interim statements to at least have some benchmark to begin the discussion. Okay. And so, you know, how far do you then fall from it between that point, whatever time you pick, and then mm -hmm. when you actually get the audit? Well, I, I think in, instead of trying to hit a moving target constantly with these internal numbers for this budget, we can look back historically and see what the trending was before yeah. um, and start, start the discussion there. You know, and I, it, I mean, it, it strikes me though that I mean, to, to kind of to Peter's point too, if everything's kind of constantly in motion, it's hard for us to sit down and set a fund yeah. balance policy if we know there's going to be other swings here and there. Right. We, you know, 1.6 or 1.7 is good if that's what we end with. But if we make a policy decision now based on an assumption of 1.6 and it ends up being one, you know, that would be a concern. Can, can I? I'm really stupid. I think. Can I, can I, can I, can I, if, if I look at this exhibit, which one would that be? It'd be. We've got a grand total of general fund of 82.8 million, right? Yes. And we've got a t grand total of expenditures of 80.1. Yeah. Isn't that our surplus of 2.6, which is what the balance sheet says, but you've come up with 1.6. I'm just really I'm going, going to based upon what is the performance to budget. Yeah, but it doesn't, I mean, what, what we should, I mean, what the real number for us is what was our revenues we think we collected, which is 82.8. Which, which just gets back to my point. The balance sheet reflects your P and L. Right, this and it shows say, the 82 and the 80. So if you have 82A and 80.1, that's a surplus of 2.6 million. Right. Which is what your balance sheet says. And that's what the balance sheet And then I, what I was trying to understand is how did we get to 1.6? Well, yeah, I think he was comparing the ex estimates with the actuals and the appropriation with what's actually been spent. Yeah, but that doesn't, difference. at the end of the day, what goes that into the matter. bank. Mm -hmm. What goes into the bank is the difference between the funds we have coming in and the funds we have going out. So your balance sheet shows we have 2.6 million. And then uh, some of that, those changes, and I'm not sure which way it's going to go at this stage, will will be affected on on the balance sheet in what's called the fund balance reserve. Some of those numbers are going to fluctuate between the prior year purchase orders that get paid this year. Those will come off. The ones that we have for 2016 that will get paid in 17 that will affect that number. We have some carry forwards; those will affect uh, those numbers. Things of that nature. So, um, yeah, it's that yeah. one that will the the actual revenues and expenditures should directly hit unrestricted fund balance. It's but then some of those adjustments that, that, will affect. That's fine, but I was just trying to understand what I didn't understand because I I was a CPA. And your balance sheet has to follow your revenues right, and, and, it, and it does. It, you can and see so the your balance sheet's not wrong. Right, correct. What I don't understand, and there is a material difference between a two point six million dollars surplus and a one point six million, and, and we know that number is going to change. Mm. But I was just trying to understand how we got from two point six to one point six. Well, so I, I think, think it's the we were just basing it on the excise that we know about and the Wentworth that we know about. The rest of this, the other million might be other revenues that I'm not taking into account. 300,000 of it is probably premium, so we're almost at 2 million right there. Three, 300 and something so I, I, know what you're, I know what you're saying. So for this discussion, maybe one six is the floor that we're supremely confident we will not be below. Okay. 2.6 is likely to be the yep, hopper. Hop right. And by the time we get done, it's going to triangulate somewhere in the middle of that. Okay. Right. Between those two numbers. I mean, that's the best we can. Yeah. And so, to Peter's point, Peter, so I compared the performance to the uh, budget yeah. and trying to identify where was the breakdown in the surplus. Mm -hmm. So that's, I might not have done that uh, uh, very well, so I apologize. Um, but I was trying to get to the, what was the core. And originally I thought that about a million dollars of it was the, if you remember, the million dollars came from that whole bond right. surplus issue. So that's what. I mean, the challenge with fund balance, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself, but we, we don't, Purposely budget for it. There's no line right. that oh, says no. fund balance. So right, right. It's a function of performance, right? Right. Uh, the one wiggle room is the uh, so called overlay, which is a function of the assessor. That's one of the final pieces that the assessor right. does before they set the tax rate, because he has to have money available to pay tax abatements over the course of the year. And there's some float there. So um, if not all that money used is used for abatements, then it becomes fund balance. Uh, so there's no conscious effort. What we do know, though, is over the last six years, we have budgeted, we budgeted zero use of fund balance from the town side. And are a good trend of increasing year over year to our fund balance. So we're, we're on a positive path in that respect. Right. This past year, we were able to 
to sweep a little extra down to 10% to pay for some of the capital projects. It's the first time in a long, long time, maybe ever, ever, that we've actually had that luxury that we've been above the, the limit. So we'll be using, in 2017, we'll be using some of our fund balance for the capital. The school will be using, I think, in a, uh, anticipating to use in a, the same 425000 for their budget for next, for this current fiscal year. I'm good. good. Great. Um, moving on to the uh, next conversation is around the undesignated fund balance policy. Um, before we get uh, a couple of items, and I'll turn it over to Tom and Ruth. Mm -hmm. So um, as two pieces of information that um, I asked Tom to provide and then Tom's provided some more. First is um, the existing policy that was last amended in January 20th of 2010. That's available for you. Um, I also have somewhat of a baseline draft where we might want to move towards that is, uh, I think, consistent with other communities that I found. And then, um, so with that, keep in mind it's uh, intended to be a baseline. Um, when I drafted the baseline, it's intended, so the initial title of this policy is Fund Balance Policy, but yet the policy really is um, that we have, which is in Section 2, is really just about undesignated funds. It doesn't talk about the other five four categories that you could have. So um, we want to take a look at, are we looking to just um, change the undesignated portion or are we looking for a more comprehensive policy? Um, and with that, uh, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Tom and Ruth because they have some handouts here um, that I think are going to be important as we take into consideration any changes. Yeah, um, we provided to you copies of a handout that actually Joe Patera, our financial advisor, shared with you I recall early last spring, before we got into the budget. Uh, and his presentation was kind of larger than this fund balance, that was a part of it. And we thought it would be helpful to, to provide these handouts again. Uh, I'm looking at the one, yeah, up right there. I think if you turn to pages 13 and 14, um, and this kind of goes to the point of why is fund balance important. To, uh, I guess we can talk about why it's important to us. It's always nice to have a little nest egg. When times get tough, but it's also important to the outside world, particularly the rating agencies. And these two displays show how the two major rating agencies, Standard and Poor and Moody's, how they consider the importance of fund balance uh, in their rating system. So on page 13, that shows kind of the, the framework that SP uses. Um, as an aside, SP of the two is less interested in fund balance. Moody's, it's a real hot button. It's just something they've baked into their framework. So Tom, on, on S&P, where would fund balance fall? Because it's not spelled out specifically, would that be in financial measures, or would that be? Well, I think the fact that the words don't exist on the page suggests something, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I think it probably falls somewhere in the financial measures. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't and see a- And management. And management. Category okay. for it, per se. But if you flip the next page to Moody's, uh, they have two, there's two different categories under the kind of financing broad category, um, which account for about 15% of the is a weighting factor in, in the uh, in the rating system. One uh, is the fund balance as a percentage of revenues, and the other one is that five-year trending. And that's one of the places that we've been able to show steady growth in the right direction. It's not crazy growth, but we're moving in the right direction. We're building it year over year and not using it. Um, and that's uh, proven to be quite helpful as we've sat down with them each and every year as we go into this year. That's, so that's really just kind of background context as to how, why this matters to someone else. Um, I guess internally, we should maybe kick it around. You know, arguably this is money that we've raised predominantly through property taxes, not exclusively, predominantly, that we haven't needed to run operations. And so the kind of delicate part of the conversation is we've got to be careful. Um, we're always concerned about tax rate, and we shouldn't raise any more than we need to run the operations, first and foremost, but also, you know, keep our financial house in order. And I think that's the subject of some of the conversation. Where's that comfortable spot uh, that satisfies the outside rating agencies, it gives us internal security that in times, tough times, we have some money to work the storm. 
but we don't overtax our residents such that we're raising more money than we need. And then page 18 in a yellow balloon on the upper right hand oh, yes. corner talks about uh, where, yeah. and he actually sent me the one for the city of Bangor and it had those same percentages in terms of where, you know, what's a good strong fund balance, what's a, a low inadequate fund balance. So, uh, and then the yellow balloon shows where we are at that point in time. We're actually 10% now, so we're into the strong category and hopefully headed solidly into that territory. I think the other handout kind of mirrors the same sort of, um, yeah, yeah, it is. It's really the same information. I apologize for that. Going back to, to the Moores and Cabot one, mm -hmm. on page 19, I found that interesting and what could make the rating go down? Mm -hmm. Is there anything in there that that we need to think about as we, I mean, one is as further material growth and debt, which may have touched on the conversation we had the other night around Martin's point. Um, trend of operating debt, I mean, is there, that, that struck me as something to really kind of key on as we think about policy and where we're going. Is there anything that you guys pulled off of that? Is, and I didn't understand the, the Haggis Parkway sort of comment because they said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's been a drag on us for a while. But just a, kind of a, a quick snapshot on that is the town issued. How many? Debt money? Yeah. About around $9 million, I Yeah, think. we issued about $9 million in debt to pay for much of the infrastructure yeah. on yeah. the parkway. With the expectation, um, we have sewer assessments that still apply to all those properties. Yeah. Um, with the expectation that we'd be repaid uh, monies that would we'd in turn service that debt with. Those monies have not come into us as expected, yet the bondholders want their payment. So we continue to pay mm -hmm. in respect to those obligations. So there's a significant due to. Uh, ultimately, I believe the town will be covered. We've been covering that, those debt payments, um, because they haven't kept pace with, with the performance. We finished, so, so that. We finished that project just about just before the recession, and then mm -hmm. we set up all these agreements with the homeowners and property owners, and then the recession hit, nobody bought the land, and um, then we had TIF monies, which, you know, as the value increases, that TIF money was supposed to go to pay for it too, and, but the recession kind of kicked in. Yeah, so nothing has really happened as expected. Um, so, so which side of that ledger are we gonna fall on? Are we gonna mm -hmm. eliminate uh, the, the debt, or are we gonna be facing significant increases in do from? The do from won't get any higher. It's just going to, as we start to, because the debt is starting to go down, our debt payments are starting to decrease. So there's no risk there, you're saying? I don't that. think there's risk. Their concern is that that receivable is long term and it's, you know, longer we, than we are anticipating. We bought ourselves a little time and, and got in some of the good graces as part of the wet work borrowing four years ago or whatever it was three years ago. We refunded uh, 2003, 4, and 5 series debt. Uh, so that was a total $51 million bond issue when you factored in new borrowing mm -hmm. and refunding. The, and a lot of that debt was uh, Highest Parkway related. So we were able to restructure it such that um, we're happen. in a much better position at this point. But the fact still remains, uh, the general fund has been carrying the water. Um, and then current, and then with this new refunding, our total debt is, is even though we borrowed, like seven million. I mean, our actual debt went decreased. I think from last year. Yeah. Okay. Not by a lot, but it's it's you know overall debt has gone down. So um, a little loss of this equation. Um, so when the the projects were all done, regardless of the timeline, um, the total cost was about nine million dollars. We went out and borrowed seven point something million. Let's say eight, just around it, which was less Probably than nine. the actual cost. Probably nine. Probably the whole nine. Okay. Um, the whole nine. <laughs> So that becomes a payable because we have to pay those back. At the same that's time, you have a receivable for the equal amount because that's being assessed to all of the property owners. And there's an expectation that as the receivable is paid, that's used to then pay the payable. However, yeah. that has not happened receivable because they're unable to, unwilling right. to, whatever the circumstance might be. So that's coming out of cash. That's coming out of the, general, the, the yeah. town, essentially. So while the payable will always go down because you're using your own cash, the receivable will stay flat and won't increase, correct? Correct. 
Are so, we going to write it off? That's what True. their thought but, is. But, is but, are we going to just the say no? The comment here says right. a material increase in the receivable due from Haggis Parkway. How or why would it ever increase if you've already if we spent if we that? decide to spend more debt if we decide to fund more okay. into Higgins Parkway right if we decide I think to initially more that's what was happening because right. our debt payments were so you know they they start to go up first yeah. and right. then they start to, to decrease so we've been paying it for but, but wouldn't but wouldn't wouldn't it, this also be if we decided if we had to write off that receivable wouldn't that change that would be uh, detrimental to the town yeah, I don't think we right. would. Right that That's right. We never consider that. We have we're yeah. secured by by liens on all the property, oh, yeah. so yeah. we'll get paid. Right. Just, just when? No matter when. That's right. So but if that, but, that, but that's what they're talking about. If right. something so changes, the thing right. that would change yeah. is that our receivable the, never changes, and it yeah. continues to be whatever it is, three hundred thousand or four hundred thousand. Because if this, if you write off a portion that's not being paid, that's a decrease. So I can't other than using right, but it's I'm, it's I'm, an increase to the general. It's an ex decrease to the general funds. Fund balance because we have to. <laughs> it's an increase in our liability. It's correct. Because we've written the receivable off. So if you look at the other uh, factors here under this heading, what could make the rating go down? Um, I think the first one, the trend of operating mm -hmm. deficits resulting in reserve declines, we've shown a steady trend of that not being the case, and don't expect to yeah. change anytime soon. We just talked about the second one, significant de decreases in tax base. I think we have solidly demonstrated mm -hmm. year over year we're, we're showing great growth in that regard. Our demographic profile, uh, maybe with the uh, aging of the population, I, I, I don't know. Of all of them, I don't see how that would have much effect. Uh, we'll, I'm not sure how we can control that, uh, mm -hmm. who lives here and what their profile is. Uh, and then material growth and debt, that's been the subject of kind of ongoing conversation, how much is too much. And I, I get the sense that we're probably at the upper limit where we're at. Well, yeah, there's the 48 million we've identified for right. the municipality we want, and we don't know what the school number is, but that's that's think, lurking in that number. I think the way to manage that is that we don't take debt on until we can yeah. we can stomach it. Right. That uh, you wait, <coughs> then we we've got the amortization tables. We can figure out when we can take additional debt on to stay to keep it that comfortable. Although it's interpretive to some extent, the very first challenge, moderate revenue raising ability due to LD1, and as it relates to the whole expenditure piece, almost suggests that they would prefer us to increase taxes rather than increase debt. So increase the increase the tax rate to pay for what you need rather than just going out and borrowing it. At probably in our situation, because our debt is so high, there it's probably true. On page 18, off to the left, it kind of talks about some household per capita, yeah. effective yeah. borrowing. I mean, yeah. we're, we're very strong. We're extremely strong under market value per capita. You know, our top 10 taxpayers were very diverse because we're below the 15% that they're talking. That all suggests that a lot of the uh, demographic profile in Scarborough is, is not deteriorating, so. At all. Although our overall net debt per capita is high. That's right. That's the one knock, I guess, yeah. mm -hmm. if you will. But the, the but offs not dangerously, comparatively, I guess. Uh, they don't have a, a dangerously high. It's just as high. But what's not beyond our ability. So yeah. I don't think right. it's strapping us at this point. But, and and yeah, what's but, nice is that it shows that we're, because the bulk of that is probably in, uh, you know, buildings, infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it says that we're also being very proactive with our infrastructure maintenance and we're keeping you know, we're not letting our buildings fall apart around us. So it, it strikes me maybe perhaps as part of the fund balance discussion, which is what this is kind of leading into or predicated on. Um, uh, do we want to explore ways of using excessive fund balance to lower debt? Yes. So um, if we go to the existing policy, just uh, mostly for, um, and I'm only going to read the section that relates uh, to this um, to talk about it. So I'm, I'm going back to the actual council's policy in just a second. I want to look. Um, if you look at paragraph three, two and three, um, the current policy reads, the town has set a goal to maintain a level unrestricted fund balance of 8.3%, in parentheses, one twelfth of Scarborough's operating budget for the prior fiscal year, do not fall below 5%. Once the town achieves an unrestricted fund balance of 8.3% of Scarborough's operating budget, any excess above 10% will be assigned for capital needs or for property tax stabilization of the town. By assigning any excess for capital improvements, the town will reduce the amount necessary for bond financing and, in turn, the related interest costs. 
I'm not going to read through the other pieces because it's more narrative. So the question, um, so the original request to look at this um, was driven by the current fiscal position that we are in where we are exceeding 10%. Um, is, do we want to look at um, all of our options? This is very limited where it says, at least in my view, you must use the excess above 10% for capital projects. Um, or. <clears throat> or stabilization. Or, or stabilization, which stabilization has a broad term, uh, definition to it, so it's, and which is not defined in here. Uh, so the question, in, outside of changing some of the definitions that are in the first part in a different format like I've presented. Um, and if, just to ask okay. that, um, we haven't done it in a long time, but how would we actually use it for property tax stabilization? I suppose we'd actually budget the use of fund balance and thereby reduce the otherwise tax rates? I would assume the following year, whatever, if you have an excessive balance, when you redo the next cycle, you just lower your tax request. I'm assuming and that, and though, I don't know. The, the way you would lower it is you actually budget the correct. Of fund balance. Correct. Or you could. It's broad enough definition on the way some chunk. You could also use it to pay down debt, which, which would change the debt line, which is a stabilization. So, so it's all broader now. But that's still using, well, that's, you still have to show it as a revenue, and a, you, mm -hmm. yeah. debt is still the debt. So yeah. the county, um, being on the finance, uh, the county used to have a rate stabilization fund where X percentage of all surpluses in a year would go into the fund and be allocated out during less than favorable economic times, and it was kind of, you know, as a stabilization. Um, so how you do that, you can either put it into a designated fund, you can automatically put it into the next year's budget, which is kind of what we do here. Um, it, you know, can be designated to capital projects or it's just, you know, um, you have to better, I think we have to better define this stabilization piece um, as well. Um, so what I, what I did in this document, by the way, and I just realized I sent the wrong draft uh, to get copied and there's a couple of uh, things that need to be deleted because I plagiarized and stole from other communities. Um, and so the language is sometimes uh, not as consistent. Um, the crux of at least the unassigned um, designated fund balance um, is um, I wanted to uh, so right now the floor is no less than five where goal is 8.3 and not to be higher than 10 is really my crux is to simply look at those thresholds but there's been some um, expression to me as chair by others that we also want to look at um, what can that be used for, towards because it does seem a little limiting at least in the definition document maybe we include and so I included um, in my example, to start talking of uh, uh, funding future capital expenditures of projects, the retirement of debt, um, it could be placed in a rate stabilization fund, it could be a taxpayer refund, it could be, um, or it could be simply retained and we violate our, you know, retained in some type of fund or used elsewhere. So there's different categories that could be included and I just wanted to at least have a conversation around that. I'm not saying I, you know, I have no preference, I just wanted to at least initiate the conversation. One of the major purposes of the un, um, unassigned fund balance is to help during catastrophic items. So that might be an item you would want to add. I mean, uh, <clears throat> if, if we if we were the city of New Orleans, you know, our fund balance would have been three yeah. times gone. Right. Yeah. This amount, you know. So um, we I do think that's part of what they're. We do accomplish that with the 8.3 percent, though, because that's what one twelfth of our operating in theory, right? Bit. Right. That's the intent. However, if you right. had to, I know there are emergency provisions, but if you had to, even if you yelled from the town hall, we're having a meeting, you know, right. you still have to get the people who are involved if there's a, some kind of situation where you can't all meet. That only, I mean, it sounds like a lot, but it's only one month. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And you've got, you know, your fire, your police, yeah. right. community services, right. public works, they're right. all going to be continuing to work. They're going to need supplies. Like they're going to need Natural yeah. disaster, correct. So that's part of the, to me, that's the biggest reason to yeah. have this. And, yeah. and I don't want to oversimplify, but I, I hear what you're saying, that there should be conversation around those state thresholds, up or down, or, um, and then maybe an expansion of uh, the use of fund balance above that higher threshold. That could be accomplished by a fairly simple amendment to the existing policy if, if we wanted to kind of simplify this effort. And provide more <coughs> definitions. I think that's a piece that's missing also. And Sean, I'd like to add to your list of A, B, C, D, yeah. a possibility of E. 
uh, as, as we have talked about and as McDonald Page cautioned us at the annual audit, we have a bunch of unfunded liabilities that are out there that sooner or later, like medical, may become a requirement that we're going to have to start funding and, and accounting for it. So those are things like pensions and other things we need to think about whether if we have a really good year that we start to build that as a sort of restricted fund balance. <coughs> Sure. So um, what I would recommend, so there's two, based on what I'm hearing, maybe two additional pieces. First is uh, maybe an E would be catastrophic event. Uh, I, I guess I need to kind of think through and get a recommendation from Ruth what type of language um, and how to make that, whether it's a fund you have to create or what, I don't know, you know, or we just simply say that. And then the uh, F would be retain into a designated fund to fund uh, a designated fund uh, to cover unfunded liabilities or something in that sort. So I guess um, let me kind of take it uh, maybe a slightly different tact here. Um, rather than try and create a policy that could fit every single possible opportunity, would we want to take a step back and make it a little bit more broad and just give authority to the finance committee or the council to say, uh, based on recommendations from staff, what they want to do because it, it strikes me that if we if you try to take everything into account and if we're having to set up one two three four five six different funds you know we'll have a little bit in everything uh, but maybe not enough in one particular one to serve its purpose it's just a thought mm -hmm. yep so um, if we compare what we have we have a, two sections we have sections for definitions of the types of accounts or balances and then we have the policy that really is just about undesignated funds. Mm -hmm. If we look at, um, based on other communities I've looked at, the um, subject area, which includes definitions, is more of a narrative approach rather than a uh, bullet approach. Um, but they're very similar, and it's using current GASB language that I just simply pilfered off of um, other towns. So there isn't really, if you actually take the first two paragraphs, it's very similar to some of the narrative that's in the fund balance policy. Um, then it covers, because it was brought to that this policy should also talk about the other funds that we have and not just undesignated. And how do we monitor those balances? How do we know uh, when is money going in, when is money coming out, and where are the balances at those periods? So it tries to deliver some of, I think, what is being asked from everyone. Um, the two pieces are expanding this definition, and that's what the list is for. And it's not intended, and it does state, um, in my language, it says, we'll develop a plan to allocate the excess fund balance in the next budget cycle to be used for any combination of the following issues. And I think that becomes a policy statement out of finance and part of the recommendation of the budget for the full council for consideration. It becomes one part of the budget. It's about fund balance use, which there's already a, there's already a part in it. It's just not something that we typically concentrate on. We concentrate more on the expenditure side than we do on the balance sheet. So um, this provides, I think, a little bit more definition. The list can include whatever you like because it comes down to whatever the statement that the current council and finance committee want to make. So I just wanted to expand yeah. it. The reality is, in practicality, we're, we're never going to have enough above that upper threshold to Do satisfy I. any one of these. Right. 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 Uh, maybe the unfunded liabilities over time, but you're always going to have the need for the rate stabilization fund. We're always going to have debt that we could retire. So I mean that's the danger of kind of the shotgun approach is that you list them all and it gives you the authority and the flexibility, but do we ever make any headway on any of them? But I think that for the long-term planning piece, and this gets us out of that one and two year kind of approach, is that if we're looking, even on the debt side, if we're looking and you know, we're looking at the bonds that are coming due um, or are callable, maybe it's better we just simply pay those off and take that out of the out of the debt line and not make annual payments, you know, make payments because it frees us up a little bit you know maybe i mean that's a very far i think uh based on the dollar amount i don't think we're going to have that much in excess fund balance to be able to do something like that but it's always an option well i think um, one could also argue that that's part of the rate stabilization if you're taking right. debt service out of your operational budget uh, you're reducing your debt service that's effectively less you're yeah. effectively doing it right? the other thing you could do is to list make this long list and give the flexibility but you could also prioritize it so there's a little that was my next focus uh, associated with it. Yeah, I, I, just keep in mind it because I'm not looking for a. Um, I 
caution because then if you put like one of the options I, I had to at least acknowledge was a taxpayer refund. We put in this in priority order and we don't put taxpayer refund <laughs> as number one. I can see uh, quite a bit of criticism. So I just want to kind of be careful with that because it doesn't matter whether you put this in high to low or low to high. Um, it's going to become the council's prerogative on how it wants to kind of do that. And I'm not looking to create a conflict. Right. So, policy change. so along those lines then, um, in terms of, of still maintaining control, what if we remove the list and just say per, <coughs> put some language in there. I'm, I'm not what, crafting it yet, but, you know, some language is per the recommendations of the finance committee. <coughs> and then we have that as our normal policy and goals anyway. I mean, this for the next few years, maybe it's debt reduction. In three to four or five years, maybe it's, Unfunded liabilities that we've that are starting to come yeah. more prevalent, or something. You know what I mean? Where I, th I, I just, if we run the, I think if, to your point, if we prior prioritize right now, that might not necessarily be the priority in three years, well, five years. Future council can change it in the whim. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. this is probably the. Um, so I'm not a big policy guy in the sense. I, I agree with you. The fewer words that you have, the better, because mm -hmm. it is about flexibility. However, there's certain policies that I think that for the public's purpose, you need, you need some detail, and this is one of those, because while we can say uh, a stabilization um, of the tax base, some people will take that very differently than others and what we should do, and mm -hmm. so it should list out what it might include, and I, I think that, that other than a taxpayer point. refund, every other item is some type of stabilization. I agree. Mm -hmm. So and, and taxpayer refund would end up reducing the amount of the refund because the amount of work and effort to generate those checks or whatever to the taxpayers would probably well, that's, I mean, you have to be in one of those uh, basis to astronomical situations of getting just a, you know, maybe. To give it to just the homeowners, to give it to the businesses, do you not give it to blah, blah, yeah. Right, so that's a policy, <laughs> right. So the other piece is that um, whatever we, however large that list or short, um, the other piece is really the threshold in which you then measure what you want to do, which is really in the paragraph uh, one, two, three above where we started, where it says the fund balance establishes the minimum unassigned balance equal to X or X percent of uh, or ratio of a total general fund expenditure. Uh, equally, the fund balance establishes a maximum. That would be consistent with the existing. Um, I will say that what I wrote here as a baseline for conversation um, is slightly out of um, uh, context of what was in the current. Because if you remember, it says that we want to have an unrestricted fund balance of 8.3, but it should not fall below 5 within a cap of 10. Mm -hmm. This provides simply a bottom and then a top. However, you could also then, because in, in order to make it match, what you would say is that you want a minimum fund balance of 10, but not to fall below 8.3, and it should not be any higher than 12, 15, whatever it might be, because you may sit there and say, you know what, it's not, um, it's better that we actually retain the money right where it is between 10 and 12. It's not going to hurt us by keeping it. We'll wait and see what happens next year, and then we can allocate it. Could you, um, could you simply go one more rung up the ladder? So replace the 5 with 8, 3, 3, replace the old 8, 3, 3 with 10, 10. and then move to 10 to 12 as an increment. It just ratchets this up. Uh, one more. So, yes, um, for me, I think from a conversation, but I do want to say uh, personally, I want to be careful about that upper level because I think that you can, while the creditors may sit there and give you a positive and a positive rating, I think it's a disservice to carry too much of the uh, reserves uh, for the people that are paying. <coughs> so, whether that t is supposed to be 12, I mean, there's some communities that are 15. Right. I think even um, so we were being talked to that some of them are now getting up as far as 20. Then right. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. Right. But so I just want to. So I think I think if you know the goal is to not affect the bond rating and to try and strengthen us. Um, if we look at the ranges that we have here out of Moore's and Cabot's presentation, strong is eight to 15 uh, percent. I, I think setting that parameter is fair and justifiable. Um, and the midpoint of that. Somewhere well, in the middle of that is it's 12. 12. Right. So, uh, That's why right. right. there's yeah. rationale yeah. for it. Right. I think five's too low. I, yeah. I, I, so I think five right. was set because we were probably at below so five at that point, you know, and we were trying to work our way back. Yeah. My only concern would be is if we do find ourselves in a situation at a later time and we find another recession and we start chipping away at that fund balance, if we then change the policy, is that going to, you know, if the future council changes the policy down to five again, 
will that reflect negatively on our debt rating because we're adjusting our policy to, or, or as long as we adjust the policy, we're covered. You know what I mean? So it, it depends what question is asked and how you answer. How it's answered. But I think that to be fair, though, is that um, one of the things that Tom has shared with us in the past with the bond, when they did the bond presentation, is that while we have gone below 8.3%, which is what is in our policy, we didn't go below five, and as long as we can explain what our plan is to get back to that, and then we adhere to that plan, that gets us the positive outcome that we received recently. So what's not included in the old policy is the next paragraph where it does read what I'm recommending. In the event that the balance drops below the established minimum level, the town council will develop a plan to replenish the fund balance to an established minimum level within two years. Yeah, so it was abundantly clear to me it's, it's most important to have a policy in the first place. Right. And then secondarily, um, to follow. <laughs> Even if the thresholds are lower than they're comfortable, Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we'll ever be in a position of getting an upgrade in our bond rating because of our fund balance. What we're trying to do is guard against a downgrade. Hit. And so I think it's wise not to shoot too high. Let's do something that's within our abilities. Um, but maybe a bit of a stretch. I, mean, I really like we should be proud of the trend that we're on, that mm -hmm. we're not using it and we're building it. So what does 12% get us that 10% doesn't? Because right now we're 8 to 15% is really kind of that that spot to make the adjustment. So what does that extra 2% get us other than a larger reserve? More, some really fine bond rates, right? What potential? 5% of revenues, and I'm not sure if it's operating revenues, what kind of revenues, but the bond rating agencies use that as their benchmark. 5% of revenues. Mm -hmm. My benchmark sense. for what, for having 5% of revenues? For fund balance, They're your unassigned fund balance. So you don't get any? Just oh no, they just prefer 16 or higher. So, 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 so I think Chris we're is, within. So, the so I think the question becomes: What do we get for it? What do we, we get, get for the two percent? I mean, if yeah. it's nothing, then so why, why not sweep it into an account that we use it somewhere else? Well, or five percent? I'm, I'm, well, I'm thinking more of the tent going from 10 to 12. So right. I mean, we don't want to go and below eight, which I, I agree with. I mean, I think we got it to your point. It's if that's the emergency aspect of it. If we have it now, let's not take it away. Uh, so at least right. make five go away, right? Yeah. Go away. I would suggest I that, yeah. That. Yeah, I would say keep eight as the minimum, or eight three or whatever it is you, three, three, you, three. you call it. Um, my concern would be is that if we go to 10 or 12, to your point, Tom, are we keeping more fund balance than we need to, unless we're getting some return on that? I mean, if, if we think we'll get a couple basis points going from 10% to 12%, then maybe it's worth it. Um, if it's a wash, maybe we keep the 10 and we sweep whatever the sweeps are afterwards, then we can use that for My or something. I don't know. seldom, if ever, will get positive pieces out of it. This can only hurt us. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't think we're ever going to be building fund balance that we're like off the charts and, yeah. right. and we're seeing credit for that. If we do, we're probably going to be for three years and then we're gone. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the value I see, I don't think there will be a um, monetary or uh, metrics value as far as credit score, uh, credit rating. There won't be like our... Um, you know, we can decrease our bond, you know, uh, premium uh, cost by a quarter point. <clears throat> but I do think it actually plays into going to the 12% um, as the top threshold gives you two pieces. One is that it allows you to take more time to do longer range planning so that you will then, so you can keep in essence by allowing the maximum being 12. It, um, one, it provides assurances to the public that at 12% or better, you're going to get something back, whether it's in uh, use of it for the current debt or whatever it might be. It's going to go back in to reduce the burden of any future debt or any other costs, no matter what. It's mandatory. You have, a, uh, you have opportunities where you got to do that. However, between 10 and 12, you could, as a council, decide, you know what, we're going to keep that because we want to make sure that this year we see the same positive trend. And if we do, then we can allocate ourselves in one year any excess at that point. Um, because keep in mind, we have to transition from this year-to-year -year kind of approach to budgeting to hopefully something around three years. And so I think you need a little bit of a gap just to be for comfort. Um, and the one piece that's not included in either policy, by the way, is, um, a, a, you know, a mandatory that, so if you do do the 10 to 12, you know, put in a statement that says um, you cannot be greater than 10% for more than two consecutive years or three consecutive years. So this gives you the threshold you can't be less than 8.3 for more than two consecutive terms because you need a plan to get back there. There's also no plan on the other end that says that if you're greater, 
when are you going to when are you forced to have to use it? So well, the twelve percent does. If I read this correctly, it says Sorry, is once you hit that threshold, it's the next year you, it kicks out, right? If that's right. what our existing policy says. You spend it down. Right. You yeah, spend it down. Right. So we're probably a couple of years away if we move it to twelve to get to twelve to the point that we have excess money to do anything. Right. That's just one of the realities. I think it just occurred to me this three percent number for tax rate increase that mm -hmm. you worked with this year. One way to codify that uh, is to include it in the rate stabilization fund that these monies above a certain threshold are used for purposes of, that's really, in my mind, stabilization or predictability, maybe mm -hmm. another mm -hmm. way to describe it. You use monies to reduce the tax rate to get it under 3%. Yeah, but that ties our hand in what we use the funds for. If you say that anything extra has to immediately go into that rate stabilization fund, that limits our ability yeah. to, to put into either right. you know, other liability right. or debt uh, service uh, reduction. I mean, I, I don't think that's a bad approach in terms of what we use it for, but I... I it, it just occurred to me that's a way to codify that number. One of the challenges mm -hmm. is, and I think, Sean, you've, you've spoken about it quite eloquently, is developing practices and cultures that are repeated over time and time again sure. when the three of you are long gone and maybe Ruth and I are gone. How do you assure that happens? Yeah. So, to well, to you, well, I think to your point, the council can change anything they want, yeah. whatever they want, anyway. But right. yeah, but and then it's a governing body can break right. their own rules, yeah. I mean, just like the legislature. Yeah, I think um, we, I think we used but, about four hundred, three hundred thousand of fund balance because sure. we were over the ten percent. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. if yeah. if we think about that, that's what we would have we be using to bond. So mm -hmm. that would be four hundred thousand more in bond proceeds or bonding debt that we would have in the future that we now don't have. So right. that, in effect, kind of helps to stabilize that mm -hmm. yep. tax rate, yep. too. And then yep. we don't have that future interest in payments that we need to do. Yep. So the, the but, debt piece but is... But keep in mind is that no matter what we do, there's going to be criticism about the policy sure. and about its use because, to your example, Tom, is that I can, I can hear already um, the devil on the shoulder sitting there yelling, saying, um, your real um, your real increase is five percent, but because you have this, I mean, we got this this year based upon the school bond issue. Yeah. You know, the, the real expenditure is not what's being told to you because we have this slush fund. Yeah. Um, when it's just a, and when it's about good planning, um, so there's going to be criticism no matter what we yeah. pick and choose. So isn't isn't capital the the best thing to choose? And I say that because it accomplishes rate stabilization. So and as a banker, and, and there'll be a <laughs> no. Anyway, I'll say those. Uh, there will always be capital Indeed. needs that need to be funded. And more than likely, the, um, historically, but I think we funded that with debt service sure. as opposed to appropriated or reserves. Right. Uh, to me, it, I mean, uh, yeah, it, but that I can I can see the counter argument of that as saying that if you approach it that way, then you're always going to seem like you're always going to have to spend X millions of dollars every year, no right. matter what, whether you need it or not. Um, right. And I, I mean, I, I, I can understand both sides of that. Um, I just, to the point before about policies, I, I prefer to have a little bit, maintain as much flexibility as possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because if we do decide that, you know, let's say the, our debt service is something that's critical this year and that's what we want to focus on, we at least have the flexibility to be able to say this is, these are funds that are available to us to utilize for that purpose. We could choose not to. We could choose to put it back in capital, too, if, if that's a better I was, approach. I was just trying to think that contrary approach as opposed to the laundry list of and right. adding yeah. flexibility is so a couple of very specific things that everyone understands. Yeah. And I mean, I'll add, I mean, I am, a, I mean, full I'm a banker, so it's, um, I always believe you can borrow money. Uh, borrowing money is sometimes is good. Um, it all depends on the rate in which you are borrowing the money. And there's going to be times in which the rate is better to sure. borrow than to keep the money invest elsewhere. Um, however, um, one of the big pushes um, right now for this and why is, is the outlook about where we're going to be in a year and the fact that the Fed is talking about increasing rates. Borrowing money may not be the solution for those smaller projects when we're looking at $48 million, you know, for other big projects. So, you know, maybe, maybe the use over the next year, two years, is to use it for capital rather than retirement of debt that's already mm -hmm. at a low rate. Mm -hmm. you know, so that it's, it is about timing and, and kind of having some sense of a forecast it's all you know get the eight ball out and kind of and if we're it. not borrowing then that means that's future debt we're not having to pay off right. so Correct. our debt right. is slowly going to start to come down which right. is going to give us yep. 
more money to use for other purposes. Well, so if we're going back and we're looking at metrics, though, and we're trying to look at things to measure against, I mean, page 18 is a prime example. We're, we're hitting everything very strongly with the one exception of the overall net debt per capita. Yeah, well, I, you know, um, and if that's what we, you know, if once we get our metrics discussion underway and that's one we choose to see, I mean, that's clearly, I mean, we've all agree that's, that's not, um, I don't want to say it's an anomaly, but that's kind of one of those outsiding factors that's kind of holding us back a little bit, you know. Um, so maybe that's what we choose to focus on, you know, mm -hmm. um, keeping in line with the metrics discussion. Well, and even uh, page 14, uh, even though this is specific to Moody's, I mean, I see four, five, six ratios that could be um, could be used. Fund balance as a percentage of revenues. Fund balance a trend over five years. Cash balance based on both of those, and then even debt to fill value and debt to revenue. Those could be individual metrics that we also use that help us. While we're not trying to cater to Moody's, it is at least a nice benchmark to mm -hmm. kind of see because um, they are going to be accredited. But in addition to everything that you just talked about, Chris, that was on page 18. Oh, yep. well, yeah, actually, the, the materials you identified right. too has those same things identified. Yeah. But getting back to this policy, I mean, I'd be okay if we're trying to move this. Um, I like the suggestions of, of moving away from the five and eight, the corridor of 833, and then the only place I'd be, and, and Sean, I, I agree with you on, on I think because of the transparency and people looking over our shoulders, we are going to entrust the future finance committees to make these decisions about where to put money based on all of the factors. Mm -hmm. But I think it is really important for those that are out there that at least there's some definition of what's going to be. I mean, I don't think mm -hmm. we should force rank them. I totally agree. But I think saying these are the types of things that will be sort of the menu of the types of things that we will decide what to do with the funds. Mm -hmm. Um, I think then maybe take some of it. Won't be a surprise when we do some of the things. Right. It, it's not. Right. It didn't come out of a hat. So I, I, I think the list. I, I kind of air. I, I agree with you about the flexibility, but I think at the same time, in order to build sort of that transparency and trust, it's to say here's, you know, and then they can come to us and have comments if they don't think it's right. the right decision. Yeah. I can see. So um, what I would like to recommend is to, in the form of a motion, so that we can begin work, and then they will come back to the next meeting is to um, um, to accept, um, so my draft document can be the baseline and we can start looking at it from that perspective. Um, this is nice, I don't like the, personally I just don't like the format of it, I, the definitions are out of place. There's something in here about budgets that have nothing to do with fund balance. Um, it's, it's a stylistic approach, but um, it provides a little bit of better definition around non-unassigned fund balances as well. So if we can maybe take a look at what's that, if, if you don't mind, we can take a look at that. Um, and based on what I've heard, um, I will change that paragraph, at least for the conversation um, on the threshold of 833, 10, and 12. We'll also amend the list to include the catastrophic and the unfunded liability f uh, focus. Um, I also I will mention that um, there's a paragraph above the, fun above the thresholds that was not intended to be here. I totally disagree with this. So I want to make sure I'm not proposing that. I'm, I would recommend deleting it, and that is um, it recommends that um, two -third vote or the it requires a two-thirds vote um, in order to um, make changes, and I don't, agree, I don't agree with that. So, um, Do you want us to define what stabilization fund is, or do you want to? In, in, yeah, I think that, in fact, what we might want to do is actually provide um, some guidance in the document around prioritization for if we are going to do retirement or debt, how would we prioritize that? You know, how are they selected? From as broad as, um, it might be simply a statement that says that the finance director will recommend <laughs> um, a list of debt to be retired as a result of this. I'm comfortable with something like that. I don't need specifics. Unless the, unless the other members do. I don't think we can actually retire debt on our own. We can do the advanced refundings, but that's about it. We can't say. But you don't need to reissue it, right? That is this retirement, is it? Was some of them are callable and some aren't. Uh, right, so, so that's why the recommendation would have to be those that are callable are the ones that you come as a yeah, right. have to do versus, yeah, so whatever you think, I would trust you, if you don't mind, to kind of give us that uh, mm -hmm. language. Okay. Because obviously it has to be callable. You don't want to have penalties. You're gonna, you know, first, it's got to be callable. Second is that you want to minimize any prepayment penalty or call penalties, right. you know, whatever that might include, as well as the rate stabilization fund. Do we um, want to remove um, D? So a taxpayer refund, I would or like re, to... Or reword it? So I would include a definition on how that would be, um, you know, and 
you know, maybe it's a statement that simply says that the finance committee shall make a recommendation to the council. If this, me if this mechanism is used, the, you know, the finance committee will make a recommendation to the town council. So if I, if I could suggest, why don't you rework this? Yep. Um, and then submit it, and we could, or do you want to take it up as first reading now, and then make yeah, the because then yeah, because then it will just stay on the agenda as unfinished business. Um, that way, it's out there. They know that we're looking at it. It's uh, I don't want to surprise anybody with changes. Okay. Well, then let's just accept this. Then I'll, I'll move accept as written, um, and then we'll first make draft. whatever changes need to be yeah. Yeah, as first draft and first reading. Or and we'll do definitions for the catastrophic yeah. comment as well as the yeah. unfunded liabilities. Yeah. Yeah. That has to the unfunded liability piece has to be a little bit broad in statement because. It's, um, we don't know what those are in the sense of what is the industry trend going to be. Like well, mm -hmm. We know what they are, but we don't. We don't know what. We don't know when it's going to happen. That we're going to have to be required to do it. Future ones, even. You yeah. hope that you get advance notice, but yeah, I'm trying to think. Just, I guess where I am, just as a, as a community member, is even if we're not required to do it, we may want to think right. about getting ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. You know, there's no harm parking the monies there, and then that's so that. That's where I want to be, so oh, that's down the road. So mm -hmm. I also didn't mention the roof did find these um, yeah, guides to the uh, fund balance. This is through the GFOA, and it's set up in a Q&A format, so it's a quick read. Um, I might suggest that something you just thumb through right now in the next meeting. Um, it might help inform different aspects of the conversation. It's all in the same territory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, by the way, I, I did get this the draft. It was from both. Um, actually, it was almost identical. ICMA, which is the same source as that other information, which is, and then it was um, GASB, I think it was. Yeah. If I could just uh, kind of similar but different. We talked uh, in the past about getting uh, some of those materials. You do have this. Okay, perfect. This is for the metric discussion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. perfect. We have so, a first. Um, we need a second. Yep. Yeah, no, I think second. Peter seconded, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Why? So, yeah. Uh, all in favor of uh, accepting the motion? That's three to zero. It's accepting it as first draft. As and first draft. We'll come back in a somewhat revised form next yeah. time. Yeah. Great. So the goal, by the way, to make sure the goal is to actually have this before the council. I think there's some preference before November, but definitely before the next budget cycle starts so that the policy is implemented. Also, it's once it's done, so it's not right. done for two weeks. Um, moving on to the next uh, conversation, I want to turn this over to Tom. Um, it's metrics, uh, final condition, and financial condition analysis, and benchmarking. Yeah, all I was really intending to do was, um, and it was interesting. Peter shared uh, with all of us um, uh, this kind of random, this resource document. It was one of the ones you identified yeah. a couple months ago. Um, so great minds think alike. So uh, Sean had done some work. Summer, late spring, I forget. Yep. And we provide these. So these are three different Thank you. Uh, resources. Uh, they provide a lot of in depth detail as to you know, what potential metrics we might use. And I'm certain in those documents we can come up with a handful. And I don't know what that magic number is five, six, eight, ten. Uh, but I don't think we need to start with a whole huge long laundry list. Let's focus on the thing that's really important. Uh, just moments ago, Sean, you mentioned four or five that are kind of in here. So um, I might suggest we don't overcomplicate this, that we find the ones that make sense and we, we get to work doing this. Um, I've also uh, have a, an offer extended for an assistant town kind of manager and this is one of their big responsibilities. So I, you know, I'd love to bring her in right on the ground floor of this conversation. Um, one of the Tax, tasks I gave her was to look at those materials uh, and report back to me on some metrics you might use. So it's kind of an academic exercise. And I was pleased with kind of the first first uh, review she had. So I think she'll be a resource to all of us to help yeah. the conversation. Yeah. When's the start date, if you don't mind me asking? Is that agreed to you? third is okay. the plan. They're going through the final uh, uh, physical and post opera testing right now. But so uh, with that, um, maybe some homework um, or a suggestion for homework and two, um, just a uh, personal comment. So um, would it be okay, Tom, if I suggested that for each of us that we come back for the next meeting uh, with um, top five to eight at the most um, recommendations? 
And with that, I, I wanted to uh, recommend that as you look at these, because there's a lot of information, and what's great about this handbook also is that there is also about more in-depth. You take one ratio, you can then do further analysis to kind of drive down. It also gives you the formulas to how to calculate it. Right. So it's oh, very God. tedious, but it's great. You bankers, Jesus. I thought That's engineers awesome. were bad. No, awesome. Some of it's obvious and fairly easy yeah. math, but other ones it's helpful to have a little guide as to how you actually calculate that. So one of the things that I wanted to suggest is that the goal of a board is to look at the enterprise as a whole or kind of look at it holistically from a global perspective and not um, necessarily drive your conversation. It, it's actually called the uh, strainer effect, meaning, it, and I emphasize it's strain on, not strain. So you have a, you have a strainer, like a spaghetti strainer, and um, to, the level of detail is really the, the holes that are in the strainer. And so how much information is passed down, you have to determine from a policy perspective so when you look at some ratios, you may not want to get um, the actual, like specific by, by department. So you may want a uh, debt to revenue for the entire town, but yet um, is there also maybe an opportunity to look at debt to revenue by department or in particular departments that it's relevant for, so such as maybe fire and police, you know, public safety versus schools. So one thing that I wanted to recommend is that um, I personally would, I would like to see a dashboard of all these metrics um, as part of our budget evaluation, mm -hmm. where we're kind of given that, what is the top level? And then what are maybe some supporting metrics <coughs> by either department or a special focus within that particular, so as an example, like I just said, the debt to revenue. Is this a good example? Yeah, so it's the example that's on page five, um, where it literally talks about the different categories, revenues, expenses, operating position. But what I'm saying is that you look at the town Below as a that, whole, get, yeah. mm -hmm. And then you might look at education and then public safety. What are the two, you know, whatever the components might be, um, and, and they become subsets within that. Just so, and that becomes more of a nice to know from a prioritization Wasn't perspective. Wasn't there also some conversation, once you establish the, met the metrics, you might also want to establish um, ranges? Yes. Mm -hmm. If we mm -hmm. pass this threshold or dip below this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the flag waves or we take some sort of evasive yeah. action, I guess, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's part of the exercise. But, uh, you know, so going into that is that, so um, for a town, so there's always this debate about um, are we looking at the town as a whole or, you know, why are we looking at just one department? Well, sometimes you need to look at one, one department, but you have to be fair and have a reason for doing that. So, uh, you know, there's certain expenses that I think you need to look at for just public safety versus because that aren't relevant to community services. And that's where you set some departmental goals and not just a community-wide goal. So. You know, as an example, we've talked about debt. You could look at it strictly from the town as a whole, but you need to understand the components within where that money is being spent. So maybe you set your goal based upon departmental issues. So I, I just wanted to kind of get us kind of thinking about what might be a good global goal and then what might be some of the individual and what department it focuses in on. Yeah, it, it strikes me too, looking at some of this just sur superfluously here, that the, um, the star cities, uh, matrix. Uh, I'm wondering if that's, um, do we have any kind of broad brush stuff to start with, like in terms of like a, almost like a, a, a decision making matrix, if you will, or something like, uh, no, I mean, you look at page five on the on the book, if you don't have it in front of you. There's a little chart there that basically has, you've got environmental factors, organizational, and financial factors. And it's kind of a matrix of interconnected stuff. But I don't, I recall seeing something similar to that. Very elaborate. Matrix with the star communities. Yeah, I, um, is so that uh, this group? I thought we'd focus on the financial factors. Yeah, yeah no, I, I, I'm just thinking in terms of the dis like the ta yeah uh, the decision matrix in terms of you know not looking at the whole big picture from star, but taking ours and kind of plugging it into that format for one mm -hmm. small piece of it, mm -hmm. um, and seeing how that kind of cascades yeah, into I'll some of the other things. That, see how how we can maybe integrate this effort into a larger effort. I guess the other cautionary note that I just kind of provide up there to all of us, let's, uh, I would rather start a little smaller and do things well mm -hmm. rather than, you know, not, uh, data for data's sake. You know, let's, right, right. let's be thoughtful and strategic about what we're analyzing and do that well first. Mm -hmm. And then we can broaden our horizons after that. But I think it's great. If everyone does their homework and comes back, uh, we can have an exercise of kind of identifying what's in common. So, 
just the time of that time. So what I was getting at about the granularity of the information. So to start off, I would like to look at um, debt, either debt per capita, debt per revenue, whatever the right ratio is, for the entire town without breaking it down because there's going to be people automatically jump that want to see what is that on a school basis versus mm -hmm. other services. I want to start at least getting the metrics out there just for the town as a whole. Mm -hmm. And then as we acclimate the new person that's going to be really managing mm -hmm. this and doing, then we get into the individual pieces <coughs> later once it's been established. So I think, you know, at least for me personally, I think we're on the same. I want to look at the bigger picture. We've, we've talked about this for well over a year, so I'm anxious to finally get to the point of nailing some things down and moving ahead. <coughs> Any other comments or questions? No. Uh, moving on to future meeting dates and times. Uh, so uh, the month is almost over, yeah. um, and we're not able to meet at the next. Uh, we were originally talking about, I think, the 28th. Correct. In my head, I don't know if that's the right date. We're not going to be able to meet that day because uh, mm -hmm. one of the two of you, or oh, maybe wait. both of you, are out. Yeah. So okay. we're looking at August. August. I'm sorry. <laughs> going backwards. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> October. Can you believe it's almost here? Uh, so the first meeting would be the 12th, correct? 10-12 uh, at 6 p.m. Um, I believe, I'm, I know I'm free. And then the next would be the 26th. Um, so with the work that we have, we would want to, at least on the policy, maybe have that second meeting. Unless we, you think we can get it all done on the 12th, because we'd want to forward it to the council for the first meeting and, well, Probably maybe the second meeting in October, or you know, for the council as a whole, the first meeting in October, in November second. November second, I think is the first. You see what I'm saying? Be comfortable. Well, so I think if we can get it done on the twelfth, then we can submit it. It can actually go to first reading on. Now, with this, uh, the fund balance, would that need two readings? One well, reading. Of council yeah. policy. Uh, once okay. again. Um, Chris, you have your calendar up. What What is the council second? October meeting in October. Uh, week later in the council meeting. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have those in my calendar, but I'm, I'm looking at October's 5th, 5 and 19 are the 1st and 3rd. So yeah. if you do things on the 12th, theoretically, you could turn around on the 19th. Yeah. You just get fun balance, though. Would be for sure. well, well, exactly. Yeah. Then fall back, you do it on November 2. And, yeah. and really, the, um, the metrics piece is still ongoing conversation. I mean, we might be able to report out kind of. Let's focus on. Yeah, I doubt it would have to be needed. Great. Now, the other piece um, is not on here. I, I forgot to mention this. Um, so we had started this conversation, and it needs to pick up at some point. Um, just from a timeline, and I'm not saying it needs to pick up like now, but um, we have been, I've disclosed this in the past, and this is about the compensation analysis uh, process for the town manager. Um, again, just to reiterate, this is not out of, uh, this is aligned with, the manager's next contract um, negotiation review process, which starts next year. So we do need to keep that on our plate because um, we've promised to deliver an analysis to the full board um, for next year or so. Um, and we're looking at some other issues that are within that. So I want to make sure that that gets on the next agenda so that we constantly have it because that's really the next big thing. That way it stays with uh, the new council as well. Um, outside of the, so right now we're only going to plan for one meeting in October. Is that good? Oh, so you don't want the, October 12th. you don't want the 26th then. Oh, why don't we just hold it and then. Just hold yeah. it in case. Yeah, if we yeah. don't need it, we don't need it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll make okay. I, and then, um, any public comments? Not seeing any. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor. So is there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. I can't believe it's been the summer. I know. Close the pool up today. Good. It's definitely over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely <laughs> over. Great <laughs> job. Um, any any sug suggested responses for for no for the email that was shared? Why don't you forward it to Tony? I, I sent it to you. You could respond that you forwarded it to the town manager for the response. We'll find a way to. I, well, I, I could just conveni conveniently say, well, well, whatever. I'll let I'll let you handle you know, that. If, if you need me to, then just. Yeah. Yeah.
go see a man about a horse right now. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, no. Thank you. And on one side of me, thank says, you, ladies. Yeah, cool. yeah, thank you. Thank you. No matter what Chris says about John. What are they going to do? Chase him down the beach in one of the ATVs or something? You know, I mean, you get in a full gallop. Even you know, the bike guy's never going to catch up. <laughs> Well, I, I just apologize too. I said what I was trying to get at, which I thought that of the two point six million dollars that was this point worth bonding, but that's in next year's budget, which means that. But, but it's our fund balance this year. Yeah, but, right. be but the bottom line is we have fund balance going in. It's positive. Right. It's positive. Yeah. It's positive. Yeah. positive. Right. Well, Not and right. Tom brought up the other. We have like almost almost two hundred thousand in overlay plus abatement that's right. been granted. Right. Which doesn't hold five hundred thousand dollars. Right. So, plus. You know, right there. That's I, 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 again, I'm looking for big picture catastrophic things. I think we're good. <laughs> it's all good. I mean, it's not like, it, you know, we've been in there in the past. Where it's Thank you. Going down. Okay. Yeah. Thanks.